COVID-19 is spreading in the U.S. and around the world very quickly. You've probably heard something about how it's growing exponentially, but most people don't really understand what that means. When leaders in the media use technical jargon without fully explaining it, all they're really doing is sowing confusion. In reality, exponential growth isn't all that complex, though it can be confusing and certainly unintuitive. What it really means is that something, be it COVID-19 infection numbers or anything else really, is growing in a very specific way. And in the case of COVID-19, very quickly. This growth or spread tends to follow a very particular pattern, which is what experts mean when they say it's growing exponentially. But before we understand exponential growth, it's important to understand how we should be thinking about growth more generally. I'm Jeff Gallick, and on today's episode of Data Demystified, we'll be discussing growth rates and how they can help us understand the incredible fast spread of COVID-19. The title of this video says that it's about compound interest, which doesn't sound like anything having to do with COVID-19. And yet the exact same forces that explain the spread of COVID-19 explain the amazing power of compound interest. Albert Einstein once famously said that compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it, earns it. He who doesn't, pays it. Personally, despite understanding it pretty well, I'm still constantly amazed by how powerful it is. If you're not familiar with the idea of compound interest, stick around and I'll make that very clear in just a moment. Ultimately, it all comes down to a simple idea, that things grow in very predictable ways. For example, in nature, we can predict growth in population sizes of animals by understanding how quickly they reproduce and how quickly they die. On social media, we can predict and see the spread of growth of ideas based on our understanding of how quickly reshares or retweets spread through a network. For diseases like COVID-19, we can predict the speed of growth of infections by understanding how contagious a disease is. And in finance, we can understand how quickly your money will grow when it sits in a bank account by thinking through the way banks pay out interest to us. To help us understand all of these ideas, I'm going to start with that last example, how quickly our money grows. For that, we need to dig into the idea of compound interest. And once you understand how compound interest works, you'll be able to not only understand what exponential growth is, but also how experts predict how quickly COVID-19 will spread, and quite frankly, how anything grows over time. Let's dig into that right now with a simple visualization of how interest works. Before we talk about compounded growth or exponential growth, let's look at the simpler case. This is what we call simple interest, this is the idea that you're going to give the bank some money, they're going to give you some interest, but you're going to take back that interest. You're not going to reinvest with them. So in this example, you start with $100, and the bank's going to promise to give you 10% interest on those $100 every single year. So it looks something like this. You start with $100 in your wallet, you hand that over to the bank, so you have nothing left in your wallet, and in total there's $100 between what you have and what the bank has on your behalf. After a year, the bank then gives you $10. You take those $10, you put them in your pocket, but you leave the original $100 in the bank. And again, in total now, between what's left in the bank and what you've taken out is $110. And this repeats. Again, the bank gives you another $10 in the second year. You take that, you put it in your wallet. That will then add to the $10 you had from before. So now you have $20 in your wallet, still have $100 left in the bank, and in total there's $120. And this continues on for the entire period that you've chosen to invest with the bank. So again, the bank will give you another $10, you get it added to your original 20, that's 30 more dollars. In total, there's $100 in the bank, $30 in your wallet, or 130 altogether. Continues again. Again, $10 goes over to you, goes back into your wallet, adds to the original amount. So you have $40 in your wallet. You keep investing those original 100. You have 140 in total. And in the final year, again, you get 10 more dollars from the bank. $10 goes over to you, adding to your 40, which gives you 50 in total. You still have 100 in the bank. And so in total, there's $150 over this period. The bank got to borrow $100 every single year and paid you for that benefit. They gave you $10 every year. You took those $10 out, and so you got $50 extra that you didn't have before. And so you started with $100, you got $50 from the bank in interest, and you have $150 in total. This is the example of what we call simple interest or non-compounding growth. So now that we understand simple interest, let's move to the more interesting version, which we call compounded interest. Okay, I know that some of you are going to yell at me and say that interest at banks actually compounds continuously, which is a bit different from what I'm showing right here. You're right, of course, but this isn't a video about finance. It's a video about growth 
And for that, annual compounding will work just fine. Let's get back to it then. So we're going to start the same way. We're going to have $100, and every year we're going to give it to the bank. But the big difference is we're not going to take out the money that the bank actually gives us every year, that 10% interest earned. So it looks something like this. You have $100 in your wallet. You hand it over to the bank, which leaves you with nothing in your wallet, of course. And in total, you have $100, which is the same as you had in the non-compounding case. Nothing is different here. In the first year, the bank gives you $10. But instead of putting it in your wallet, you add it to the original 100 that you had in the bank. So now you have an extra $10 in the bank, and you're going to add that to your original $100. So you have $110 in total, nothing left in the wallet, and $110 in total, which is the same as the non-compounding case. But the difference is that now the bank is going to pay you for the right to borrow not $100, but $110. And so you're going to earn just a little bit more interest. In fact, you'll earn $11 in interest, which is 10% of $110. And again, you're going to add that to the amount that you had in the bank before, which is $110. And so now you have $121 in the bank, nothing in your wallet, $121 in total, which is now a little bit more, just a dollar more, than you had in the non-compounding or simple interest case. And this continues and repeats. So this time the bank is going to pay you for the privilege to borrow $121 from you, and they'll give you $12.10, a little bit more than last time. Again, we add that to what we had before. We have about $133 now, nothing in the wallet, and again, the total is $133.10, which now is just even a little bit more than we had in the non-compounding case. And again, the bank is now going to pay you for the right to use the $133 that you left in the bank, and so they'll pay you $13.31. We again add that to that original amount from year three. We have $146, still nothing in the wallet. We have $146 in total. And now that's getting to be a little bit more than our non-compounded total. And in the final year, they're gonna give you $14.64. We add that to the amount that we had before. We have $161, nothing in our wallet. And so we have $161, $61 of which we earn from compounded interest. And we can compare that to the $150 we had previously in the non-compounded case. And what we find is that we earn an additional $11.05 by letting the bank borrow the interest that they paid us every single year. This is the idea of compounding, that every year you're not just getting interest on the original amount that you put in, but you're getting interest on that original amount and the extra amount the bank pays you every single year. Now, this might not seem like a lot. $11 over five years, who cares? That's not a big deal. There's two things to consider here, though. First of all, we're only starting with $100. Most people are going to be saving, hopefully, a lot more than $100, and so this effect grows, of course, with the amount that you invest. But much more importantly, compounded interest and exponential growth really benefits from time. And five years might sound like a lot of time, but let's take a look at what happens when we look at a much longer time horizon, like 10 years, or 15 years, or even 30 years. When we do that, we'll see that the effect of exponential growth becomes massive. And so rather than go through this visualization for another 25 years, let's simplify things by showing a graph. And this is a typical way in which exponential growth is shown. So here I have a graph where on the bottom axis, the x-axis, I'm plotting the number of years that have passed since investment. And on the vertical axis, what we call the y-axis, I'm plotting the amount of money you have at the end of any of those periods. So let's just go through again the first five years quickly and see what that looks like. So we start with $100, that's true in both cases. After a year, there's really nothing different. We have the same amount of money, whether we have a compounded interest or simple interest, that's fine. After another year, we have a slight benefit, right? We've earned an extra dollar, still not much. After another year, we've earned an extra $3, a little bit more in compounded interest. After the next year, we've earned $6.41 extra. Still not great, but so it is. After five years, we've earned yet another $11. Now let's see what happens when we let time do its thing with compounded interest. So let's forget about our first five years and just focus on the graph for a second. If we let time move forward for five years, what we see is that after a five-year period, we've earned $259 with compounded interest, but only $200 with simple interest. So we made an extra $59 just by virtue of the fact that we let the bank keep borrowing our money. Let's fast forward some more. Let's go to 15 years. Now we've earned $417 with compounded interest, and only 250 with simple interest. So we paid an extra $167 by doing nothing, just by letting the bank continue borrow our money. Let's go another five years, let's go to 20 years. So now compounded interest, we've earned $672, more than double what we would have earned with simple interest. So rather than taking money out every single time, we let the bank continue to borrow, and that money grows on itself. It exponentially grows. 
Let's go all the way out to 30 years. But before we do that, let's just imagine for a second. You're a 35-year-old. You put $100 in the bank, and you wait 30 years to retire at age 65, let's say. $100 doesn't seem like a whole lot, but what we see from compounded interest is that after 30 years, that $100 turns into $1,744. Compare that to the $400 you would have earned from simple interest, and you see just how powerful compounding and exponential growth can be. Now imagine saving not just $100, but a whole lot more, and you can see how quickly you could amass a large amount of money just by letting it sit and grow over time. Time is what makes compounded interest, and in particular exponential growth, work so dramatically. And if you still want more intuition, I've built a simple simulation that I'll link to in the description below, where you can actually play with some of these numbers, like how much money you invest, how much time passes, and what interest rates are to see just how compounded interest, an important version of exponential growth, works. I've also put together a short walkthrough video of how to use and interpret the simulation, and I'll link to that below as well. Hopefully, at this point, you have a pretty decent grasp of compounded interest, but you might also be wondering what this has to do with the spread of diseases like COVID-19. The simple answer is that the way that diseases spread is exactly the same way that money grows when you let it sit in a bank and compound. Let's look at a very simple take on how diseases spread while focusing on what experts call the R0 number or the reproduction number. This number is just the growth rate of a disease, just like an interest rate is the growth rate of money. Let's see how this works with a very simple example. Let's say we have 10 people, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look and see how those 10 people spread their disease to other people over the same 30 periods that we used in our interest example. We'll assume that the R0 number is 1.1, which basically means that these 10 people on average will infect 11 other people, 1.1 times 10. And what I'll do is I'll show you a bit of a parade here of people who are getting infected. So maybe not the most cheery parade you've ever been to. And below I'll show you the same graph that we used before to demonstrate how interest grows over time. So let's take a look at what happens. Those 10 people initially infect 11 other people, who infect 12 more, who infect 13 more, who infect 15 more, 16, 18, 19, 21, 23, 26. So after 10 periods, there are 26 new people who are infected. Those 26 people then infect 29, then 31, then 35, then 38, 42, 46, 51, 56, 61, 67 people. It's starting to grow a whole lot faster, and we can see that down below in the chart as that graph becomes steeper. It's climbing more and more. And again, this is the power of exponential growth. It doesn't just grow, it grows faster every single period. And if we play this out to the same 30 periods that we used in our interest example, we can see just how dire this could be. So those 67 people go on and they infect 74 more people, then 81 more people, then 90, 98, 108 people, 119 people, 131 people, 144 people, 159 people, and finally 174 people, all of whom who don't even fit on my screen. And remember, this isn't just fun little clip art people. These are real people that are getting infected. So with an R0 number as low as 1.1, so after 30 periods, we're already seeing infection rates skyrocket. What's important to note, though, is this is just the new number of people who get infected every single period. We can also take a look at this a little differently to see the total number of people that are infected over that same 30 period window. So what I'll do is I'll show you a slightly different graph. This is the exact same data, except that now I'm showing it to you on a slightly wider axis, vertical axis, because I need to actually show more numbers. So the green line is actually just the same as we saw before, that's our new infections. But what we need to account for is the total number of people that get infected. We're just going to add as we go along how many people get infected altogether. And what we see is that number balloons very quickly. Over these 30 periods, we started with 10 sick people, and now we have over 1,800 infected individuals. That is with a relatively low R0 number of 1.1. When that number gets higher, infection rates balloon even faster. Now what's really important here is that we don't know what a period is. If it takes months for someone to infect someone else, this isn't too bad. 
There's plenty of time for scientists to develop vaccines or treatments. The challenge, though, is that diseases like COVID-19 spread very quickly, and the period can be as short as a single day. That means that in one month, we can go from 10 infections to over 1,600. This is the power of exponential growth. For investing, we love exponential growth and gladly benefit from it. For diseases, however, that same growth can be deadly. And let's not forget that we're only talking about an R0 number of 1.1. If that number is higher, which is very likely for COVID-19, growth rates explode. Let's quickly look at an R0 number of 1.5. Seemingly not much higher, but a whole lot more explosive. Looking at the graph, after 30 periods, we're seeing daily new infections of 1.9 million people. That's not a typo. And we have over 3.8 million total infections. Hopefully you see that exponential growth is incredibly powerful and also highly sensitive to small changes in growth rates. So with COVID-19 and any other disease, the name of the game is getting the R0 number down as low as possible. In fact, if the number drops below one, that means the disease will eventually die out. Let's see what that looks like with an R0 number of 0.5. That means that each person will infect, on average, 0.5 other people. Let's look at an example of 16 people who start with a disease. Those 16 people will infect 8 new people, who will then go out to infect 4 new people, will infect 2 new people, will infect 1 more person, and poof, no more disease. So a small R0 number tells us the disease is so not contagious that it'll disappear quickly. The hope, then, is that we can get the R0 number for COVID-19 as low as possible by following the latest guidelines from health experts like social distancing, wearing masks, and washing hands regularly. R0 numbers are just a reflection of the current growth rate of a disease, and with some personal sacrifice to the common good, we can all do our part to bring down the R0 number for COVID-19 and stop the spread of this horrible disease. Just like with compounded interest, I've put together a very simple simulation that I'll link to below that will allow you to get a deeper intuitive understanding of how diseases spread exponentially by varying R0 values and seeing what happens. I'll post a short tutorial video of that as well to walk you through the simulation. As always, what we're doing here is devising a recipe for how to think about situations where things can grow and shrink with time. That could be populations of people, subscribers to YouTube channels, income from interest, disease spread, and even proliferation of new technologies like smartphones. The point is that if you can understand how exponential growth works, you can have a deeper intuitive appreciation of the world around you. If you found this interesting, please take a moment to like the video and subscribe to this channel. Also, if there are topics in the world that involve data and you want to get a better intuitive understanding of them, leave a comment below and I'll do my best to create content meant just for you, my viewers.